If you'd open your Bibles tonight to James chapter 3, follow along in the passages in the handed out notes or on the screens. James chapter 3. Continue the series on contextual exegesis. Tonight's topic, the whole body. Let's read the verse of interest. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and sets on fire the course of nature, and is set on fire of hell. There's a false teaching connected with this verse. And the false teaching is that James was concerned about the effect of the believer's tongue on others. Was James, in fact, concerned about the effect of the believer's tongue on others, or was James concerned about the effects of the teacher's tongue upon others? Two different things. The incomplete context. Let's ask a couple of questions. First question, whose body is defiled? Second question, whose tongue causes the defilement? Let's back up to verse 1 of chapter 3. So often when this is presented, this particular verse, uh, chapter 3 and verse 6, it's connected with the following verses, and no one wants to back up to verse 1 and see what the context is. So verse 1, My brethren, be not many masters. Word for master here is teacher. A warning. James is giving a warning. Be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive greater condemnation. He's talking about the responsibility of the speaker. Responsibility of a preacher, teacher, evangelist, apostle, or a prophet. What they say, because it will affect many people, comes under greater scrutiny. We could say, based on this, that the father's responsibility in the home, that he has greater responsibility and greater scrutiny than his wife does for how the children are brought up and what they're taught. But the concern here is on the speaker. And that's where James is laying his comments. My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. If I teach something that's not true, I hurt everyone that is hearing my voice. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and also able to bridle the whole body. The idea of the body here is the body of people that are hearing the voice of the master or the teacher. Let's go down to verse 3. Here we find an illustration of the effect. Behold, we put bits in the horses' mouths, that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Now, if you have ever ridden a horse, you realize that the reins or the bridle the purpose of it is to pull the horse's head to the left or to the right, and as you pull back on the bit, the bit goes further into the horse's mouth. The horse resists. And, of course, if you want a horse to stop, they pull on the reins, and the result of that is the horse's head goes back and the horse is taught to stop. And so with just a little bit of movement of the reins, you can control the horse. He's comparing it to the teacher and the effect of the teacher on those that are the disciples or the students. Second example that he gives in verse 4. Behold also the ships, which though they be so great and are driven about with fierce winds, yet they are turned about with a very small helm 
whithersoever the governor listeth. So we've all seen pictures of sailing ships. Some of you may have boats or have had boats in the past. And you know that it doesn't take very much for the rudder to move the whole ship. That's what it's talking about here. The man that stands at the helm, he may have a, a big wheel, if it's a big ship, to give him mechanical advantage, but he turns a relatively small rudder. And the whole ship moves to the left or to the right, I guess I should say starboard or port. Doesn't take much to affect the whole ship. Doesn't take much to affect the whole horse. Now, verse 5, even so the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. Now, if you think of a forest fire, what does it take? One match. When I was little, a, uh, I think it, it may have been before my time, but at least when I was little, there was Smokey the Bear, and they would have run commercials on television and warn people about the carelessness of one match. And, of course, the Smokey the Bear image was based on a, a bear that was uh, hurt in a forest fire. But there's an example. It just takes a little bit of fire to create a huge fire. So is the tongue. And now we come to verse 6. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members. And it's talking about those that are hearing from that tongue. That it defiles the whole body, the whole assembly, all of the believers that are affected by the one that's speaking. And so this is far different than the way this is normally um, spoken from. You could say, well, who's the message for? Well, the message is primarily for me. I'm the one that's supposed to be fearful tonight. When I read the word of God and I realize that I'm going to come under great and greater scrutiny when I stand before God. God is going to say, well, on this night, you spoke from this passage, you got it wrong. Hopefully he doesn't say that about me, but he could say that about me. And then what he shows is, and it affected those guys and those guys, this one, and even a later generation, because I got something wrong. So this is a fearful passage for any teacher or preacher. It says, and sets on fire the course of nature and is set on the fire of hell. The word hell here is Gehenna. It is the, there are two words, or actually three, um, that relate to this English word hell. One of them is what we would call Hades, and that just refers to the grave. That's not this one. This one is Gehenna. Gehenna refers to the Hinnom Valley outside of Jerusalem that was constantly burning. They dumped the garbage there. The fire was never quenched. It was never stopped. It was always burning in this area. And that's what we generally know as hell, is Gehenna. When Jesus spoke about hell, he was speaking of a continual burning. And here it's relating it to the seriousness of getting something wrong from the word of God and affecting others because you get something wrong. Now let's look at the extended context. And the extended context tonight is the continuation of this passage in the book of James. And here we see that it's, it's a little bit widened out from just the tongue of the preacher or teacher. Verse 7. For every kind of beast, of birds, and of serpents, and of things in the sea is tamed, 
and hath been tamed of mankind, but the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Therewith we bless God, even the Father, and therewith we curse men. See the contrast here? Which are made after the similitude of God. So does it make any sense to bless God and then curse your fellow men when your fellow men are made in the likeness of God? It doesn't make any sense, but we do it. Out of the same mouth proceeds blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be. Does a fountain send forth at the same time sweet water and bitter? Can a fig tree, my brother, brethren, bear olive berries? Either a vine, figs, so can no fountain. Both yield salt water and fresh. Who is a wise man? Who is endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conscience his works with meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not, lie not against the truth. And you see, here's the significant thing, is this idea of lying against the truth. Some teachers and preachers sometimes do that. Sometimes the rest of us do that. This wisdom descends not from above, but is earthly, sensual, and devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. But the wisdom that's from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy, and good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. So what is wisdom? It's never partial. Something applies, it applies equally to everyone. It's without hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is, of course, saying one thing, doing another thing. True wisdom is without hypocrisy. Verse 18, and the fruit of righteousness is sown in the peace of them that make peace. So we see in this passage in James, I think we can say two things. One, the master or teacher comes under greater scrutiny when he stands before God. The second thing we can see in the later part of the passage is there is an application to all of us as far as what we say to others, to watch our tongues and to not be unruly and certainly not to curse our fellow man. Let's take a look at the whole context. The whole context, we'll see quite a bit of warnings about false doctrine and false teaching, false apostles, false teachers. And I want you to see these things because Whenever you hear me speak, you should compare what I say to the Scripture. If you don't find it in the Scripture, you don't accept it. That's the way it has to be. I've my whole life told individuals that have asked me questions, I've told them what the Scripture said, and I've said, you get into the Scripture, you dig it out, and you see if it's so. And if it's not so, don't pay any attention whatsoever to me. So what I'm kind of urging you to do is to, in a sense, be skeptical. How do you know just because a sign says church that the person in the church is telling you the truth? First of all, he has to know the truth, and he has to be willing to tell you the truth. And you should be concerned about that. In the whole context, let's look first at a warning from Christ. This is in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 17. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. Those are two references, two of the three sections of the Old Testament. Sometimes it was used of the whole Old Testament. That's probably what Jesus means to indicate here, but... The three sections were the law, the prophets, and the writings. The writings include such things as 
the Psalms and Proverbs. We know pretty much what the law is. Those are the books of Moses. And then, of course, in addition to that, we have the prophets, which includes the historical books. It says, he's not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. A jot or a yod is the smallest looking letter in the Hebrew alphabet. And the tittle is a little mark that would mark the difference between a resh and a dalaf. That would be an R and a D. Uh, you could probably compare that to the difference between a T and an F in English. The F has a little hook that goes across the top, and you missing that hook, you're going to look like you've got a T. Verse 19, For whosoever therefore shall break one of the least of these commandments and teach men so, he shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. So we see a lot of scrutiny there. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you, except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. And so here's the warning for, from Jesus about teaching. And of course, this validates the entire Old Testament. You probably have heard somebody, you may have said it yourself, I certainly have heard people say, well, I worship the God of the New Testament. I don't worship the God of the Old Testament. Well, it's the same God. Christ just validated in this passage everything that's in the Old Testament. If you don't like the Old Testament, I'm afraid you don't like Christ. Because he said everything was valid that was in the Old Testament, right down to the letter. Now let's look at some warnings from Paul. Romans chapter 16, verse 17. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which called, caused divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine, where doctrine just means teaching, which ye have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, by good words and fair speeches, deceive the hearts of the simple. Fair speeches, flattering speeches. You see a lot of that going on on TV, on religious programming. Verse 19, for your obedience has come abroad unto all men, and I am glad therefore on your behalf. But yet I would have you to be wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. So Paul's desire would be that you wouldn't even understand anything about evil, in a sense that you would be naive when it comes to evil, but very knowledgeable about that which is good. Then in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10, once again, Paul's writing this, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. So the unity here is to be unified around the body of teaching that's key in the Scripture. It's not just to be at peace with people but it's to be unified in what the scripture says. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 16 and 17. There's another great warning about defiling the body. Speaking of the body of the church. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. This is teaching us here is tonight the Spirit of God is present with us. We can't see him, we can't feel him, but it tells us in the scripture that he is present. The temple of God. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For we are the temple for the temple of God is holy, 
which temple ye are. And so that's what Paul said, and he actually said it to the church in Corinth, which was the worst example given in Scripture of a church as far as them being scripturally grounded. They had more problems. The book of 1 Corinthians tells us chapter after chapter concerning their problems. And nevertheless, Paul said that they were indwelt corporately by the Holy Spirit. And let's look down in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 17 and following. Now in this I declare unto you, I praise you not, that you come together not for the better, but for the worse. First of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and partly, and I partly believe it. For there must be also heresies among you. This is what Paul expected, that there would be false teaching among them, that there would be false teaching in any church. Now why? That they which are approved may be, may be made manifest among you. And what he's speaking of here is, is that there would be some that would be teaching incorrectly. And you would scrutinize them, and you would compare it to the scripture that you have, in the case at this time they would have had the Old Testament. And that you would discern whether the man is wrong or right. And if he was wrong, you would reject what he said. If he was correct, you would accept what he said. And so Paul expects that. Now, we have an example in chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians of how far off some of the people were that were associated with the church in Corinth. Chapter 15, verse 12. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? I don't think you can get more heretical than that to deny the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you deny the resurrection of Jesus Christ, then he simply was a man that died that taught some good things. He rose from the dead, that's proof that he's God and proof that he can raise the dead, which includes those that have believed on him. So there was a mess in this church among some of the people that were associated. But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ be not risen, then our preaching is vain and your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we've testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is Christ not then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, you're in your yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep, referring to those that have died, believers that have died in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. And see how important it is here. If someone was standing in the Corinthian church and they were saying, no, they didn't believe the resurrection was true. Well, they're going to come under great scrutiny. Actually, in that particular case, it would point out that they are not genuine believers, and so we're not even talking about a minor thing. They would be damned. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13. Here Paul speaks of some false teachers. He says, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. So they look good. I mean, if you expect that a false teacher is going to come in and he's going to say, I'm a false teacher, and he's in some fashion going to look bad. No, they're not going to look bad. They're going to look real good. They're going to be enjoyable to hear. Perhaps a lot more enjoyable than it is to hear me. 
It says in verse 14, And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is of no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. So Paul warns the Corinthians about different people who would come. It was very normal in the synagogue to have a traveling speaker come through and for them to allow the traveling speaker to speak to them. We find that when Paul went to different places, different towns in the synagogue, he would be asked, do you have something to say to us? And if they didn't like what he said, which they didn't many times, he was thrown out of the synagogue, and in several cases, he was beaten with rods because they viewed his message as heresy. Now let's look in the book of Galatians. I've read this passage many times, I think, to you. It concerns another gospel. This is how strong the warning is to be somewhat skeptical of people and to compare the scripture and to make sure you're hearing the truth. Chapter 1 and verse 6, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. You get any stronger than that as far as rejecting somebody? Let him be accursed. Verse 9. And as we said before, so now, so, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that which ye have received, let him be accursed. Suppose somebody came in and said, you know, you can be saved by being baptized. Paul is saying here, let him be accursed. Not preaching the grace of God. We are saved through grace, by grace, through faith. That's a continual message that Jesus, the disciples, including Paul, preached. Then down in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 11, we'll see here a little bit of the problem that was coming into the area of Galatia. Galatia is part of... Uh, uh, south eastern Turkey, beginning in verse 11. You see how large a letter I have written unto you with my own hand. As many as desire to have a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. So there were those that said that circumcision was necessary if you were going to be saved. That was the message they tried to carry into this area. For neither they, they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but desire to have you circumcised that they may glory in your flesh. But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. And here, of course, he's talking about the resurrection from the dead, when there be a new creature. And in Ephesians, Chapter 5, and verse 6. Let no man deceive you with vain words. For because of these things comes the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be ye not therefore partakers with them. Here's the warning to the Ephesians. Let no man deceive you. You see, I, I, I'm afraid that some people are almost asking to be deceived. They never question anything. I'm never offended when somebody questions something that I have taught. They may not, may not agree that I am being biblical. 
I may have to answer some questions. I'm not offended by that. That's the way it should be, according to what we see in the Scripture. And every preacher should think that way. It's actually a pleasant thing to get a question because it shows somebody's thinking. Somebody's paying attention. Somebody maybe doesn't like me. And that can be a good thing if I'm not telling the truth. Then in Philippians chapter 3, you notice I'm going from book to book because these warnings are continuous. Chapter 3 and verse 17, Brethren, be followers together of me and mark them which walk so as to have us for an example. For many walk of whom I told you often, often, he says, and now tell you even weeping that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is their shame, who mind earthly things. He's speaking of those that would teach something other than salvation through the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 16. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or a new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Let no man beguile you of your reward in voluntary hum humility or worshiping of angels, intruding into things which he has not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, and not holding the head from which all the body by joints and bands have nourishment, ministered and knit together, increasing with the increase of God. Wherefore, if you be dead with Christ from the rudiments of this world, why, as though living in the world, are ye subject to ordinances, touch not, taste not, handle not, which all are to perish with the using after the commandments and doctrines of men? He's contrasting here the truth in the Scripture with a bunch of rules that men have come up with that they've attached to try to say you are saved through keeping rules. It's not what the scripture teaches. Verse 23, which have indeed a show of wisdom in will worship, that is in restricting yourself, and humility and neglecting the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. So there may be certain things that might even be wise to do as far as don't eat a certain thing that's going to harm you but you see that is not what you do to have salvation and that's Paul's concern 1st Thessalonians chapter 5 verses 6 and 7 therefore let us not sleep he's talking about somebody that's just unawares you know when you're drowsy you know, sometimes I'll sit with my son-in-law on the couch and we'll be watching some type of a video. And I'll just be drowsy. I mean, you know, in a half an hour, I'll see five minutes here, five minutes there. That's all I'm going to see. I don't even know what the program was about. Too tired and drowsy. He says, therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch. Be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night. They that be drunken are drunken in the night. So the warning is to be watchful. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. So he's saying, don't, don't be afraid that the day is going to be here, and he's going to tell us why. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. He's talking here about an apostasy, a period of, of heresy, and that the man of sin be revealed. So this period of heresy is connected with this man of sin that's revealed, the son of perdition, 
who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that all, uh, all that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. So Paul here is talking about don't listen to people that say that Jesus is about to come because there are two things that must occur first. First thing is there has to be a period of heresy. Well, there's been periods of heresy, so that's not as much of a clue. It depends on what the heresy is connected with. Well, it's connected with this one that sits in the temple of God and that claims to be God. And we find Jesus describing that as the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. And that's in his address on the Mount of Olives, Matthew 24, Mark chapter 13, and also found in Luke. And in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 18, this charge I commit unto thee, Son Timothy, according to the prophecies that went before thee, that thou by them might war a good warfare, holding faith. This is what Timothy's supposed to do. He's younger. I believe him to be the nephew of Paul, but he is somewhat younger. Holding faith and a good conscience, which some have put away concerning the faith, have made shipwreck, of whom is Hymenius and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. And so Paul here even names a couple of people who were problematic and urges Timothy to hold faith of a good conscience. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 1, let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor. The name, the name of God, and his doctrine, be, that his doctrine be not blasphemed. And they that have believing masters, let them not despise them, because they are brethren, but rather do them service, because they are faithful and beloved partakers of the benefit. These are hard words if you're a bond slave. Paul is saying, work for your master, do a good job, serve him as unto God. Be thankful if your master happens to be a believer. And of course, today that would apply to employees, though they're not held or bound unless they have a contract. These things teach and exhort, verse 3. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he's proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions, strifes of words. Wherefore cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men, of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth. He ends this string of things here, supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. And do you think in everything in life, if you gain it, that that's somehow connected with God? Here we're talking about the gain that it would be for a servant to be released by his master, a bond servant. You suppose that that always indicates godliness? Anything that, anytime you gain something, maybe you have to go through something that's not very good. Maybe in a sense you're bound to your job because you're in enough debt that you couldn't possibly leave your job. And you have to put up with some things. And instead of griping and having envy, strife, railings, and thinking if you could get out of the place, that that would be gain, you have to think of it in another way. And I'm not suggesting that people have it easy. Some people have very tough jobs, very, very bad uh, employers. And Paul knew that when he said this. 
Verse 6, but godliness with contentment is great gain. Somehow you're supposed to find contentment. When we brought nothing into this world, and it's certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. And the indication here is if you have your daily food, and you have enough clothing to keep yourself warm, that you're to be content with that. And that may not be very much in your mind as far as having things. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truth breakers, truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God having a form of godliness. Here's the key. They have some kind of form, but denying the power thereof, such turn away. So you're supposed to look and decide who can you follow. You can only follow somebody that's following the scripture. And that's the test. For of this sort are they which creep into houses, lead Captive silly women, laden with sins, led away of diverse lusts. They're ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of truth. Now as Janes and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the truth, they, concerning the faith. They have no faith, they have no truth. But they shall proceed no further. For their folly shall be manifested unto all men as theirs was also. Titus, chapter 1, verse 10. For there are many unruly and vain talkers, deceivers, especially they of the circumcision. Now this would particularly refer to fellow Judeans. Paul, of course, is a Jew, so is Titus, or not Titus, uh, Titus' son. Titus, it's fairly clear he was married to a Jewish woman, probably Paul's sister, though he was himself a Greek. But he says here, deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped who subvert whole houses, teaching things they ought not for filthy lucre's sake, to get money. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said the Cretans are always liars, evil beasts and slow bellies. Well, that's not too flattering as far as a group of people, those that live on Crete. Always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies, would mean that they... Probably that they ate slow or they were lazy. Verse 13, this witness is true, therefore rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. Unto the pure, all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving, there is nothing pure but even their mind and their conscience is defiled. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. Well, we would be talking about hypocrisy here. Now Peter, Peter likewise spoke the same way. Second Peter chapter 2, and verse 1. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord. We're talking about serious error when we talk about heresy. We're not talking about a disagreement in one minor passage. We're talking about something that would affect the doctrine of salvation. We're talking about denying the virgin birth or denying the blood atonement, or denying the deity of Christ, 
or denying that salvation is by faith. That it's offered by grace because Christ paid for our sins when he died on the cross. We're talking about somebody that would deny those things. Verse 2, many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness, they shall with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment is now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. Peter obviously considers it to be a grave problem. Second Peter chapter 2 and verse 12. But these, as natural brute beasts, made to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of the things that they understand not, and shall utterly perish in their own corruption, and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness, as they that count it a pleasure to ride in the daytime. Spots they are, and blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you having eyes full of adultery that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls. A heart they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children, which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray following the way of Balaam, the son of Bezor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. Now, Balaam was a prophet in the Old Testament, he was not a prophet, actually, of the, the Lord, okay? And he was hired to curse Israel, and he couldn't find anything that he could curse Israel about. So he recommended that the people that were interested in him cursing Israel, that they send their women down there to fornicate with the people of Israel and to lead them astray after false gods. Verse 16, but was rebuked for his iniquity, the dumb ass, but he had a donkey, there was a donkey there that spoke to him, speaking with a man's voice, forbade the madness of the prophet. These are wells without water, clouds that are carried about with a tempest, to whom the midst of the darkness is reserved forever. And John, Mark, he gave the same types of warnings. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 1. Beloved, believe not every spirit. Now, the word spirit in this passage, you'll see it's used of a message, something that is said, okay? The, the word spirit can have to do with wind. It can have to do with the spirit of God, of course. It can have to do with, and even there, there's the breath of God involved. Uh, it can have to do with uh, the breath of a man. Uh, we can say the spirit went out of him. Uh, we've heard uh, remarks like somebody has an angry spirit, have a bitter spirit. We talk that way. But this is talking about a message here. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby ye know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. Now this would be a reference to Jesus' resurrection and appearance in the flesh. He was not some type of a phantom or a ghost or something like that. He was able to eat fish and a honeycomb. And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus has come in the flesh is not of God. This is the spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is in the world. Ye are of God, little children, and overcome them, because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. They that are in the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. We are of God. He that knoweth God hears us. He that is not of God hears not us. Hereby we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So John Mark here expects you to be able to discern. There's a difference between the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. 
You're to examine everything that is said and decide whether it is consistent with the Word of God. In 2 John chapter 1, verse 7, For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver, an antichrist. Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. Whosoever transgresses and abides not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house. Talking about helping him, a traveling man that's presenting supposedly the truth, but he comes to you with a false doctrine. Don't lodge him. Neither bid him God speed. You know, you know, say, brother, I'm with you. I hope you have a good journey. Uh, here's some food to take along, and you're not to do anything like that. If he carries a false message. For he that biddeth him God speed is a partaker of his evil deeds. I recall once a uh, Jehovah Witness knocked on my door. I will always talk to them, but I go outside. I'm not inviting them in. And I talked to this fellow. His name was John. This was in South Windsor. And uh, I spoke to him. I shared the gospel with him. He was a nice man in the sense of being pleasant. He was courteous, probably far more courteous than I was. But I told him I, the truth, and that's what I should do. But I didn't help him, and I wouldn't have wanted my neighbors to see me helping him. I wasn't going to take him out a glass of lemonade or a pot of coffee. Then in uh, 3 John, verse 9, I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to have the preeminence among them, receives us not. Well, this is talking about somebody receiving somebody that is good to be received. Wherefore, if I come, I'll remember his deeds, which he doeth, prating against us with malicious words, and not content therewith, neither doth he himself receive the brethren, and forbidding them that would, and cast them out of the church. So here's somebody that's evil within the assembly, and when somebody comes that can help the assembly, instead this man was casting them out. Verse 11, Beloved, follow not that which is evil, but that which is good. He that does good is of God, but he that does evil hath not seen God. Then we have Jude. Jude follows very closely Second Peter, chapter 1 here in verse 3. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you, to exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Earnestly contend for the faith makes a difference. You can't just include everything. It's important to contend for the things that you know for certain from the Word of God. Why? Verse 4. For there are certain men, crept in unawares, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. So they denied God. They denied Christ. They said that grace would just be lawlessness. They denied grace. Chapter 1 and verse 12 of Jude. These are spots in your feast of charity. When they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear, clouds they are without water. See how close this is to Second Peter carrying about of winds, trees, whose fruit withereth without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. 
And then Jude chapter 1 and verse 16, these are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lusts, and their mouths speaking great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. They're flatterers. Tell people what they want to hear. Beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how they told you there should be mockers in the last days, in the last time, who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. These be they who separate themselves, sensual, not having the spirit. And so nearly every book in the New Testament has warnings of false teachers. That means that you need to be skeptical. That means that you need to take your Bible, you know, open it, and you need to read it for yourself and see what it says, and that you always need to compare the Scripture to what you're hearing. It's profitable to have somebody to teach you. That can help you to see the truth in God's Word. But that it's no substitute for you seeing it yourself with your own eyes. And you have to be skeptical. You have to come in. Every time you come in, you, you should say, you know, I wonder if Brother Dom Reese will go astray tonight. I wonder if he'll say something that's not true according to God's word. I'm going to watch. I'm going to pick through every word he says. If there's one word out of line, I'm going to be ready. Let me summarize. James 3, 6. It teaches that teachers will receive greater judgment because they influence the beliefs of others. Therefore, many should not choose to be teachers. They don't know what to teach. Teaching error is a very serious matter. And God just will not overlook it. And so I'm trying to teach you tonight to be skeptical about whoever you hear. Listen, and if it's according to the scripture, just be blessed by it. Thank God for it. Thank God for the person that's speaking it. I don't care if they're on the radio, the television, in person, on a tape, on a disc. It doesn't make any difference. The source would be a little bit skeptical. But if you start hearing something where you say, I don't think that's quite right, then even listen a little closer. And if it's repeatable and it's often, then you should decide that I can't listen to that anymore. I hope this uh, helps you, and I hope you realize uh, I consider it a very much a privilege to teach and preach, and it's a scary thing for me because I will stand before God, and I will have to give an account for every word that I have said, and that is a fearful thing. Father, we're thankful for your word. I pray you'd bless it to your people. I pray you'd give them hearts willing to learn, but also hearts that are skeptical, that ask questions, and that really want to verify that they're getting the truth from your word. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.